uh, which are very long for some papers, and uh, you can I will refer you to those uh, to start with. Uh, okay, so uh, more light? No, I think it's okay. Well, I don't know. It depends on the students, not really on me. I don't need the screen. No, that one for the moment. No, 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 it's okay. No, but you can leave it this way. I will just use this half font to start with. <laughs> Don't this. But it's good that this is on for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's start. So I should probably uh, not really introduce what active matter is, but I also noticed that it has not really been done yet. Uh, so. For me, active matter will be uh, a system uh, consisting of uh, entities. Uh, so active matter. So we consider entities like we like to do in physics. Uh, and now these entities are a little bit particular in the sense that they receive energy, dissipate energy, and produce some work which is unusual for uh, equilibrium, uh, which is of course not the situation of equilibrium uh, statistical physics. And we are interested in, uh, so now we put a large number of these quantities, and we are interested in the large scale physics of these systems, right? So that's really the, the context. Uh, okay, I will not show you all the movies of birds, bacteria, fish, and all these, because these you have seen already many times, uh, so that's not necessary. Uh, but I will try to, uh, to classify a little bit this active matter system, uh, because the questions that we are interested in are, what are the large-scale properties, as I said, of these systems? which means we want to write down like hydrodynamics theory. Uh, are there specific and interesting phases? What are the transitions amongst those phases? And in physics, when you want to answer these questions, you start by considering, by classifying problems. Uh, this can be, do, uh, can be done both for a uh, static problem or dynamical problem. I mean, this is the, I mean, all the works about phase transition and uh, dynamical phase transition, model A, model B, and so forth. Um, and so this classification is driven by symmetry considerations. Conserved quantities. which uh, for Hamiltonian dynamics are often related, but here it does not have to be. Um, and so let's, let's see what we have. So uh, the typical conserved quantities that we can have are the number of particles. The energy. The momentum. I'm thinking about the translational momentum. You could also say things about the rotational momentum, but let's keep things simple. So what do we have at equilibrium? In most situations, we have conservations of all those quantities, right? Now, when you deal with active matter in suspension, I should take another color. So active matter in suspensions means that we have all these little units, but they are surrounded by a fluid or by a medium and far from any walls. So this was uh, the field of Michael Shelley, uh, and uh, this is what he was leading up uh, th this morning. In this case, you still have conservation of the number of particles. You still have conservation of the momentum for the, total su for the suspension, that is the particle plus the fluid, the surrounding fluid. But of course, you don't have conservation of energy because the particles themselves dissipate energy, right? And then there is the field of active matter on a substrate, uh, 
And in this case, because you walk typically, or you swim close to a wall, you take or give momentum to the wall, and so there is no conservation, there is still no conservation of energy, but also no conservation of momentum. Okay, so we have here or three categories of problems, equilibrium, active matters in suspension, and active matter on a substrate. This one is often called wet active matter. And this one dry. Although dry doesn't mean there is no surrounding fluid. It's a very bad name that was given, I don't know, something like 15 years ago, or something like this. As you will see in the first example I will give, there can be a fluid. Okay, so this is really concerning the particles. We have, we have said nothing about the interactions amongst the particles. So now we should also say a few things about the interactions. So the interaction can be, well, if it won't be very interesting, but they can be isotropic. That is you would interact isotropically with all the others. Ah, no, sorry, sorry, before the interactions. Sorry. So I said that these particles produce a work. Now I will specify more, and the kind of work I'm interested in these lectures is a work that induces motion, mobility, motility. Okay? So I have to specify now the symmetries within the motion. And the motion can be isotropic. It's not the, it's not the most interesting case when dealing with active matter, but somehow things of granular media, granular media that are shaken dissipate energy, dissipate momentum, and have an isotropic motion. So from that point of view, they enter in my classification of active matter, but in the, in the Cilius case in terms of symmetries for the motion. Now this motion can be a little bit more oriented. So now there is a direction that is preferred, but no front back broken symmetry. So somehow I would say that, I don't know how to call that, a nematic motion if you want, but I prefer to keep this word for interactions. So apolar directional motion. And then there is the case which we are mostly uh, used to, which is the case of polar motion, which is of course the case of most animals. Okay, is that clear? So these are the kind of works I'm interested in. And now I have to specify the interactions. Okay, at first sight, the, inter the interaction, well, it seems that you have you inherit something from the kind of motion you have. This is not completely true, because here I'm confusing motion and the fact that my particle has an orientation. And we will see in the next lecture that the orientation of the particle and the motion do not have to be exactly the same. I mean, this is very clear. Let's take this very polar object. If I throw it like this, Obviously, the, the, the speed will not be aligned with, the, angle, with the, the polar axis of the object, right? But let's say in a simple sketch, these kind of objects, you would say, well, they will align because of their shape, the, the kind of thing that can happen. Let's say there are two types of alignment. Let's, met, let's make it this way. Let's say, if, let's, okay, let's forget about this. Let's say if I have arrows, These arrows can align ferromagnetically, which means that what will happen, okay, this will give rise to something like this. And this will be independent of the incoming angle. They will always align. That's really ferromagnetic alignment. A nematic alignment of such arrows would be something like this, that if they are like this, so this is polar or ferromagnetic alignment. And now let's consider this situation when here again I have this incoming angle delta. In this case they end up like this. But if now one is coming like this and the other one is coming like this, 
they end up like this. Means delta here is smaller than pi over 2. Here, delta is larger. And so, in this case, you would call this nematic alignment. And now you see that a priori, but this is not completely true, and I think maybe Hugues Chate will discuss this because they have a recent paper about that. You see that with this object, apparently it will be very tough to do polar alignment because the thing doesn't have one arrow, it has already two arrows. If in order to do so, you would have to separate velocity from polar axis. This one can do both polar or nematic, while in this one, of course, can do neither one nor the other. Except if you decide to put on top of this particle a little magnet or something, an arrow which is independent from the motion. Okay? Good. So what am I going to talk about during this, about during this, uh, this lecture? I'm going to concentrate on polar motion of dry active systems. And the interactions, well, it happens that I don't fully control them, so I will have to study them and see to what family they belong to. Okay? Question? But yes, that's, that would be the family. Okay, yes, you can say this, that here there would be purely central interactions, indeed. So no nematic, no polar, something more isotropic, and you could call them central, yes, if you want. Sure. Well, no, I, I agree that in this list, you should also add this one. I mean, for equilibrium liquids, mostly we deal with Lennard Jones central interactions, typically. On the question. Yes. No, because if you are close to a wall, ah, there is a lubrification layer, but to transfer momentum through the fluid to the wall. So the bacteria were near a wall, the simulations were in a 3D box far from any wall. So the simulations were dealing with active matter in suspension. Whether it describes the bacteria in 2D that are more like swimming, if not uh, ramping, crawling, and everything on the substrates is another question that I would be most happy to discuss with Michael, but I don't know if he's here. So yes, the bacteria for me, in the if they are not in bu a bulk, a 3D bulk of bacteria, belongs to the active matter on a substrate. Uh -huh. well, whether the modelization is correct or not, I mean, if I don't know the work, I cannot tell you. But uh, if you are close to a wall, you don't conserve momentum. Now, this is a delicate issue, and I think there's been a confusion for a while in this field. Okay, so um, okay, so that's the first step. We have classified the things, and we have said what we would talk about, right? So polar, polar motion and dry active matter. Good. So in this field, there are two really fascinating phenomena which were discovered actually with a quite a separated by quite a large window in time. The first one, 95, last century. Uh, the first one is the transition to collective motion. Okay. OK, so that's you have heard about it, and we'll be more precise in a while. And the second one, a date, a year, please. Motility-induced phase separation, 2008. Motility-induced phase separation. OK. 
So why are they interesting? Um, and what, what are they first? So the first one is to say that, so again, we take our polar particles on a substrate and, um, and we add to that, so we have polar particles, dry active matter, and now we say plus ferromagnetic alignment. And to be a little bit more precise, this has a, a range, an, a, 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 um, an interaction range that is finite, let's say R. And if you have this, then uh, there was this work by uh, Vicek. So this is essentially the Vicek model that will be probably discussed at length by Hugues for different symmetries that I discussed before. And then in this case, this system presents a transition to a true long range order of the orientation Uh, including in two dimension, also in two dimension. And that was surprising because if it were at equilibrium, a system of arrows at equilibrium that align ferromagnetically in 2D does not present true long range order because of uh, a celebrated theorem. Okay, Marvin Wagner. So that was a surprise, at least for uh, theoretician physicists, and then they investigated this in detail. I'll come back to that. Um, and the trans so let's summarize a little bit the results. The mean field dish transition that is, you forget about space is second order. That is, if you have here the noise and here the orientation of the arrows that I could call the magnetization, you have something like this. But that's mean field, everybody interacts with everybody. Um, no space. But then if you look at the finite dimension short range interaction case, Transition doesn't look like this at all. Well, it's, it's quite peculiar. You have something like this. That is, this homogeneous state is unstable at the transition. This one, of course, is unstable. And on top of that, there are complicated nonlinear solutions, so called bands, which are localized structures. Ordered localized structures, I will ordered localized structures propagating in a disordered background. Background, okay. And this makes the transition first order. That was a debate for a while. First order transition, but it's not anymore. First order transition. Okay, these are numerical results. Yes, I will answer questions in a moment. Uh, okay, so these are the statement about what it does. Yes, questions. There was one there. This is very true. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, Leticia said that. She's right. No.
Okay, so let's phrase this another way. So let us say that there is a Mermin Wagner theorem from the translational order of the crystal. What Julien says is that there is a Mermin Wagner theorem for the orientations of XY spins in 2D. Because it's the same class. Because it's the same class, yes. No, but she says that there is no... Okay. For the crystal, there is no prescription for the bond orientation, but this is another, I mean, this is another order parameter and another uh, interactions. So you can map this on the other problem and then, okay? But as this I by far non-trivial things. I mean, the mermin wagner theorem is a theorem with quite restricted, I mean, it's cases where you can say something, it's not a broad range theorem. This is true. Not as broad as it's claimed to be, yes. They exist independently of that question. Actually, they exist even down here. And it was much later work. So, okay, so now what is known theoretically about this problem will be discussed at length by Hugh, I think, but you can derive a kinetic theory starting from, let's say, pairwise particles that interact this way. You can derive it exactly so that you find your hydrodynamics equations, the coefficients dependence on all your microscopic parameters, and then you can say all this, you can prove that there exist bands, there are actually families of band solutions, the selection of those bands is a non-solved problem today, so there are still plenty of things to do, but clearly they exist here, and the transition that is observed is actually a nucleation transition from here to the band. Okay? No, so characterization is never an issue. You can use tools to measure things, correlation function in space, in time. Uh, this you can always do. This is characterizing and there's no problem whether you are at equilibrium or not. Making a theory to predict them is another story. But you can always measure a correlation function. And if you are translational invariant, you know that it depends only between the distance between the two points. If you are in a steady state, you know that it depends only between the difference in time. All this is valid. That was the purpose of Hoche lecture. Tell you what is related to macroscopic and tell you what is related to equilibrium. So experimentalists do not have much issue with the fact of being out of equilibrium. They measure things. They average as they always do on time or on space. And then they call their friend theoretician who says, ah, but I cannot re replace this by an ensemble average, and so I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So this is this first phenomena. Yes? How it works? I just say it happens. It happens, and it happens, uh, and it leads to true long-range order. It's out of equilibrium, so nothing forbids it. It's why not? You know, remember? I don't understand the question. It's not at equilibrium because these are particles that are self-propelled, dissipate energy, etc. so I can bypass it. I mean, it's bypassed by, uh, by construction. Yes. At, so, at a, so f first of all, I don't have the clear statement. What I know is what Leticia said, this is so, it, it forbids long, true long-range order for translational invariance in crystal. Then uh, Jul Julien add that you can map the XY alignment of spins at equilibrium on that previous problem. So it also forbids the, long, the true long range orientation um, of spins uh, at equilibrium. And here in anyhow, we are out of equilibrium, so we are safe. Okay, good. So this is the first phenomenon, and it was interesting enough because, well, first, I mean, theoretically, you see the questions you ask, etc. cetera. It, it questions your knowledge about equilibrium and why it's there, etc. So that's why it motivates a number of questions. I think that was also one of the motivation of Yariv. And then uh, these bands are new, I mean, nonlinear solutions that we are not used to. They look like shocks, etc. And, and for people who draw hydrodynamics, these kind of solutions, why they are selected, 
how do they resist to noise, etc., is an interesting question per se. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is this motility induced phase separation. Which is another the second spectacular phenomena. I consider polar particles, dry active matter. And uh, um, no, they don't align. No alignment. But their velocity depends on the local density, which is also something I can put by hand in a model. And then it happens that if the dependence of this so if, the, if it decreases, so depends and decreases with, with density, and if it's smaller than minus V over rho, then these things present a condensation transition. So a phase separation is a kind to the gas liquid transition, although there is strictly no attraction, so I should say also here, no attraction. And this also does not happen at equilibrium. You don't form liquid if there is no attraction in your Hamiltonian. So again, that was a strong qualitative manifestation of something new. And here it was put by hand. But very soon, or more or less at the same time, there were simulations of a system of particles, simple active particles, the active Brownian particle uh, Yariv was talking about, but colliding with true, uh, s I mean, Lennard Jones, repulsive Lennard Jones, or something like this, uh, WCA potential, whatever you like. And just because they get crowded, they effectively slow down. So this was put by hand here but it can happen effectively in a liquid or in a gas, and then the separation takes place. And if you look at the phase diagram, activity density, you have something like this. And uh, here you have this phase separation. Here you have a disordered phase, a gas. And if you quench here, so you start with a system with low activity and you increase the activity suddenly, then you observe the phase separation and it looks like a wonderful spinodal decomposition. Okay, so as if there was an effective attraction. Okay, so can I have the screen on? Ah, it is on. Yes, it is. So now I have to turn off the light. So what button is that? Deep. Okay, so that's the summary of this introduction. Polar active liquids, new physics. The alignment promotes a transition to true long range polar order in two dimension. And density induced slowing down produce a condensation transition without attraction. So this was discussed in the context of effective models and then simulations of more realistic things. Well, more realistic means uh, spherical particles with some uh, potential. And uh, we claim, at least in this field, that you are interested by living systems, like bacteria crawling on a substrate, which are elongated, and then there is a lot of things going on, chemiotaxis, etc., etc., agrodynamics interactions. All these are clearly absent here. And so it's a question to to know whether these statements are robust with respect to all those fields that we have decided not to include in our description. Because these are effective theories. And so, can we do that? I mean, how good is that? So it's a problem of robustness of an effective theory, which is a similar question as the robustness of the Eisen class when you study magnetism. And so it in it's interesting to have systems, experimentally speaking, because don't forget that I'm an experimentalist, huh? although um, it's interesting to have systems which are in between. So, synthetic system that we claim to well control, 
Uh, at least they, they obey as simple as possible physical and chemical rules. But I mean, this, this can be already pretty complicated. I mean, for those who have studied electrophoresis and all these kind of things, it's not so simple. But at least there are GFM papers dealing with them. Uh, and so I will discuss, uh, so these are two examples, walking grains that I will discuss in detail in the next lecture. And Janus particles, I will not talk about the Janus particles. The, the, I mean, you, you heard the beautiful uh, presentations, lectures by Clemence Bechinger about this kind of particles, all, all you can do with them. Uh, there are many different ways of driving them. And OK, they, they present a number of phenomena that are interesting. And I will review some of those phenomena. That's why now I, knew this, I need the screen. And the questions are really whether these two basic scenarios are sufficient to for explaining existing experiments. How robust are the scenarios, as I already said? What are the basic mechanisms at play at the microscopic level when you consider a system or another? And in this case, if you now, can you predict really the kind of, of phenomena that you will have if, you, if I give you the particle? I give you, okay, I tell you, here is the particles. These are disks. They collide elastically or quasi-elastically, quasi-frictionless. They have two legs. I vibrate them. What kind of phenomenology will, will, they, will they present? Meeps, because if they crowd, probably they are. So if I shake them, they will move. So do they present MIPS, motility-induced phase separation? Because if it becomes crowded, they will slow down. Do they present transition to collective motion? Well, it's not clear why this disk would align anyhow, so maybe not. So if I give you a system, I give it, uh, these are the rules of the game for the individual particles and the collision. Can you make strong statement about what you will observe? And if yes, if you want some specific collective behavior, can you design the particles to produce it? This means really understanding, right? OK. So let's review some experiments, clearly not an exhaustive list of experiments. That would be much too long. Um, this is one of the oldest one. I've not classified them by the order of apparition uh, on the scene, uh, but uh, because of um, the fact that here there is obviously steric alignment in the particles. So uh, this system was alluded to in some presentation. I don't remember when. Um, so we have um, these actin filaments. Ah, yes, that was um, There was these actin filaments, and then we have molecular motors. And the molecular motor motors are attached by their tail on a cover slip. And because of this, when they when they work, essentially they make sliding the actin filaments. So it's like if the actin filaments had uh, had little legs. Uh, the actin filaments are, uh, are apolar, so these are really pneumatics. It's a little bit of a... Uh, uh, no, sorry, they are polar um, in this case. And so what they observe is that if you have a dilute system of these part of these systems, of these uh, filaments, they observe a disordered state, and then when they increase the density, they observe clusters of filaments that are moving together in a coherent way. And if you further increase the density, there are even some kind of waves propagating. But notice that these waves are pretty thin in terms of number of filaments that are, uh, conceived, that are included here. And so obviously there are collective things going on, but it's not really strictly speaking a transition to a collective polar motion where everybody would go homogeneously in the same direction, right? It's not exactly that. Okay. Then uh, there is this experiment that I will come on today in detail, uh, which is an experiment made by uh, in the team of uh, Denis Bartolo when he was still at ESPCI before moving to Lyon. Um, and in this experiment, I will explain in detail the mechanisms. You have a particle, a colloidal particle, a few microns uh, diameter, that rolls on a substrate. So when it's dilute, the particles roll in all directions. And then when you increase the packing fraction, you may assist to something as phenomenal as this. That is, you see millions of colorings moving in the same direction and forming a polar phase. OK, and now you ca this polar phase can be really homogeneous in your system. I will detail a little bit more the system later. And there is really a true transition to this polar liquid with another parameter that really truly reach one. OK? And this, what you saw here, was actually the head of a band propagating in the system. So this system actually also has, in this intermediate regime of density, a polar band. 
So that resembles very much the Vichek scenario and what I described before. Uh, let me show you a movie of what is this band is doing. So now this is the sy a system of these colloids in an arena that is circular. This is typically a few millimeters. So this is really large as compared to the, to the colloidal size. And these things now, in this band state, you can see the band traveling in the system. But these are really concerning a lot, a lot of colloids, right? And if you put it in a closed channel, then what you see is that this band is very robust, including to boundary condition, because the band propagates, hits the wall, then must be a mess here, and then propagates again, and this will never end. Okay? Good. So this system has a transition that is very similar to the, the one observed for this uh, effective V-check model. And on top of that, something that I forgot to say, yes, that was very bad, I forgot to say something important, is that in the polar phase of the V-check model, there is something very specific that you are really not familiar with at equilibrium, is that far from the transition, the density is in homogeneous. And the density has fluctuations that are beyond the central limit theorem. And it cannot be critical fluctuations because we are far in the polar phase. Okay? And in this system, as a matter of fact, in that paper, Denis and I, because I was participating to the story, claimed that there was no giant density fluctuation. And then recently they have remeasured them, including many more particles, etc., etc. And they found from different experiments a bunch of curves. So if the fluctuations were normal, the slope here should be one because you compute the variance of the number of particles in a box containing n particles, well, the slopes are larger than one, uh, smaller than two. They strongly depends on each experiment. It seems extremely hard to measure. Clearly, we are far beyond the ability of predicting any exponents, which are predicted in the theory I will tell you about later. But this is, to my knowledge, the experiment that is, as I will demonstrate, the best to check and play with testing the theory and the theoretical prediction. Okay, let's move to another one. Yes. Yes. No, it's not in that paper. In that paper, there's a figure where we show a nice slope one <laughs> for, a uh, for a smaller range of, uh, of n. So the reference for this one is a nature come, I think, last week. That's why you have not read it yet. <laughs> um, yes. And, uh, sorry, sorry, and I think that this figure precisely is in the supplementary material. You would never publish a figure like this, right? You would put one curve claiming that there is anomalous fluctuation, and then you would discuss in the supplement material that it depends a lot on the experimental realization, at least in nature. No, the fact that the fact that we are surprised is not a matter of that at equilibrium you're expecting to be Gaussian. You're expecting to be Gaussian as soon as you don't have bizarre correlations. That's the central limit theorem, right? And the fact that you are out of equilibrium does not prevent the central limit theorem from applying. So it tells you that there are very long range correlations. If I have time I will I can give you an idea of where they come from. So maybe I can even answer this question now. Aye, 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 the time is running. So the, the answer is, is pretty simple. Remember what we said about the true long-range order at equilibrium. Uh, here, true long-range order exists. Still, it's, it's very easy for these particles to do what prevent long-range order at equilibrium. So what prevent long-range order at equilibrium is the fact that if you have spins like this, well, and if they are x, y spins, so they can take any angle, it doesn't cost much to create a very small angle, and proximity by proximity, you can create a wave or even more complicated structures. Now here, the spins are speeds. And it's still easy to do this from one neighbor to the other. But now imagine you do this, and then here you have to do this, right? And now these are speeds. So what happens? I'm emptying the system here and I'm filling the system here. I'm, I'm creating something that is not divergence-free locally. And this will create density fluctuations in the ordered phase. I need the order to have it. Okay? Okay. 
Just another example, I uh, should not spend too much time on this, but so here are genus particles, these are genus particles that are propelled by a uh, phoretic effect, that is, they are coated with platinum, there is H2O2 in the solution, you dissociate H2O2 by uh, on the platinum in, uh, in H2O and oxygen, and then you have concentration gradients, the concentration gradients will induce phoretic flows, and this will induce the motion of the colloids. These are spheres, a priori they don't align, because they are spheres, a priori, I say, and they form indeed clusters, but these clusters never grow very, very large. The size of the cluster obviously depends on the velocity of the particle, so it's true that the formation of the cluster is related to the activity, but as we discussed a little bit earlier in the week, in this case they never see a nice coarsening of these clusters and a true motility-induced phase separation. Exactly. They are no. They are low. Then yes, they are here. So yes, it's 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 fine enough. Okay. Let's move to these ones. Experimentalists have been quite ingenious in the last uh, year. So these ones are not uh, Janus colloids. They are skaters. So here there is a nematid cube. It was it was aiming at at building a Janus particles that would swim like uh, with the cube in the back or in the front. And then it's, that's not at all what it does. This is what is called having luck in the in for an experimentalist. These things is are actually attracted through the glass slides, the matted cube facing the glass slides. Then there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and they start sliding in one direction or another. Again, in this case, they form nice clusters. This is the activity, I must say, is, is very nice because you, you can switch in by light. So you switch UV on or UV off. UV on, the system is active, UV off, the system is passive. And so in this system, you can form cluster, and by switching off the light, you can demonstrate that the clusters are really the result of the activity. So that's nice. But again, I never saw any movies where there would have been a nice coarsening, not talking about measuring the exponent of the coarsening, for sure. Yes. That's right. Yes, but you also know that particles evaporate the field of view. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, uh, there are reasons why things do not obey theory, right? So the the point is to find those reasons. And again, yes, they probably are closer. There's a little bit. Yeah. But I mean, let's move to this system where uh, it's this case uh, we have here the author in the room. So, but we discussed already whether really there was a true phase separation, whether we could measure the exponents, and the statistics was too weak. So, it's uh, what I say is that yes, there are of course. I mean, if none of this system was presenting none of the phenomenology of these two things, then I think the field would be dead for for long. What happens is that there is a little bit of piece of everything. It's not really fully always there, or not simple, or it might be a problem of finite time, uh, because of course the coarsening slows down and slows down. So uh, I just I just say that here we have nice evidence of very large clusters, but again, uh, not a complete you know g gun evidence that it is the coarsening that is predicted by the theory. And maybe it should not be because there are some fields. The question I wanted to to address is: Are there fields that we neglect? in the theory and that are important, like, for example, the hydrodynamics field. And I mean, uh, Michael Shelley would claim that they are very important. He even explains uh, the, the, the macroscopic flows in the bacteria only on the basis of those fields. So, okay. And then the last example, which are the walking grains. And so these walking grains, they are again, they are disks. They will move with a persistence length when they are shaken from the bottom because they have two legs that are asymmetric. This gives provide them with a polarity. You shake them with some amplitude of vibration. And when you put a lot of them in an arena, what happens is that they form groups. So first, they form groups, which means that somehow there is some kind of effective attraction. But in these groups, they are aligned. And this is all the most surprising, because these are disks. And there is no magnet, nothing there. So why do they align? And if you measure the order parameter, you see that, the so the magnetization, you see that it grows when you decrease the noise. It also grows if you increase the density. Okay, so, yes? 
Ah, sorry, what I'm plotting here, the color, is how much you are aligned with your neighbor. So you compute something like the scalar product with the, the, the neighbors given by the Voronoi tessellation. Uh, and so red means you are super aligned with your neighbors, blue means you are an anarchist. And no, uh, no, no, not an anarchist. The anarchists are the yellow one. They do anything, and but this one is in the opposition. Ah, okay. So I will discuss this experiment much more in the second lecture. But the noise is the fact that you vibrate. You produce two things. You provide velocity to the particle, but you also create orientational noise. So for gamma slower than one, there is nothing going on lower than one, and then at some point the velocity starts to increase, then saturates, while the amplitude of the noise keeps increasing, and so the persistence length actually decreases when you increase gamma too much. But we'll discuss this much more in the second lecture. Okay, well, so now I have 40 minutes. Okay, so that's the end of this. Uh, okay, so what I want to discuss in this lecture is this collective motion in, this in two systems, the rolling colloids, which I will show you is an excellent benchmark for testing active hydrodynamics theory, because it presents all the phenomenology that was expected uh, in from, the, from the study of the Vicek model, and then the walking disk, which are interesting because they, pro they, they, they display some kind of collective motion while they are disk, and so we don't know where the alignment is coming from, and so it's interesting to, to study the fact that there is a spontaneous emergence of alignment just because of the individual dynamics of the particle. And that will be related to the fact that the velocity and the polarity of the particles are not the same thing, which is actually the case for most true objects. So this might be important. Okay. I think, yes. Okay, so now, 40 minutes. It's going to be tough. Okay, uh, we can. Uh, okay, so all the things that I will tell you are in the supplementary materials, which I, th I think should have been papers in their own right, uh, uh, of the Nature paper describing. The, uh, the, the colloidal experiment. I must have the exact reference somewhere here. Uh, yes. So Nature 503, 2013. First author is Bricard, and then many others. Uh, okay, and the second one, as I said, is a nature com. Um, so 2018, obviously. And the first author is, what's her name? Uh, hmm? oh, uh, Geyer, Delphine Geyer. Thank you. And then, you, and you will al always find Bartolo somewhere in the list. Okay. Okay, good. And these two papers contain really well-written supplementary materials. Okay, so, where am I? Oops. Okay, so, as I said, uh, we have these rolling colloids. So I should explain you what they are. So, it takes benefit of an effect that is well-known, that is called the Quincy rotation. Is the spelling correct? Yes which tells the following things, does this still work? Yes. That if you take a solid body, doesn't have to be a sphere, with, uh, that is isolating in a fluid that has some conductivity, but the conductivity is weak, no, no, let's say something like this, and then you apply a static, electrostati a static electrostatic field, here, then these things will start rotating in one or the other direction, in any direction. Yes. Ah. 
Yes, go on. Okay. So this thing will start rotating. So the physics of the physics of this. Okay. So how long do I spend on that? Let's put let's say a few words. It's interesting to understand what's going on. So you will have so because you have charge in this uh, in this surrounding fluid and you apply a field, you will have currents. And the currents will obey the Maxwell equations. They will go around this surface, which is an isolating uh, surface. There might be also a dielectric mismatch, but it doesn't play any role in what I will tell you. In what we did, uh, we took into account the fact that the dielectric constant of the fluid here, which was some oil, and the one of the material here, which was PMMA or polystyrene, uh, is, uh, are different. These put different numbers, but it's not important. What happens is that here, like in hydrodynamics, there is an accumulation point. And so you will have free charge that will accumulate here. And here you will have depletion of charge. So we'll have surface charges, rho s. These surface charges obey, of course, the, a conservation qs, obey a conservation law, where this is the surface gradient. And the current will have two origins on close to the surface. It will have but the fact that you are in the fluid with the conductivity sigma in the presence of the field. But then also, if this thing is rotating, if it's rotating, we'll see how then how it's self-consistent. If it's rotating, because these charges are free charge in the fluid, they will be advected by the, by the fluid. So there will be some QS omega vectorial A R at the surface where A is the radius of the particle, if it's a sphere. Okay. Now, if you solve the full Maxwell problem, you will see, and I mean, it's quite convincing, that's what I did by drawing the lines here, that essentially the charge forms a, di a dipole. Okay? So this dipole, P, will be the integral over the surface of the charges at position Rs. And so you see that by this equation here, knowing the currents, knowing that this is the integral of Qs, I can find an equation for P. So after some calculation, you find an equation for P which has this shape, dP over dt. Let's write it a little bit differently. dP over dt, tau dP over dt, equal P um, minus, okay, or P0 minus P, where P0, ah no, sorry, plus omega vectorial P. And this is assuming that the dielectric constants are equal. Otherwise, there is another term that makes the story more complicated, but we don't need it. And P0, P0 is equal to, uh, let's make no mistake, minus 2 pi, the permittivity of the vacuum, A cube, E0. Okay, so indeed, that's what I've drawn here. There is a polarization here. If the thing is not rotating, P relax in a time tau towards P0. That is, I, I, if I even if I give a little kink, it relaxes to P0 in this time too. But now, if it's rotating, then you see that there could be a balance such that the solution of this equation will be something somewhere like this. The steady state might be something like this because of the rotation. So now, to know if rotations will set in, 
I must, of course, describe the equation of motion for the particle. Otherwise, I cannot say if the particle is rotating or not. Okay, so I have to describe the motion of a particle in a field. This is electromagnetic, and you need to know a little bit of your classical electromagnetic, which will tell you that if in a uniform field, a field like this, a sphere, so that was an equation for P, and now we have an equation for the particle. Because the particle has a dipole, this dipole that we are discussing, there is a coupling between the dipole and the, and the field that you apply. Okay? And there will be a force, an electric force, that is the permittivity of the liquid divided by epsilon zero. P grad is zero. And so here you immediately see that if E zero is homogeneous, there is no force acting on the particle. It would be zero here because E zero is homogeneous. But there will also be a torque. And this torque will be epsilon of the liquid divided by epsilon zero, P vectorial E zero. Actually, what you would have expected from just symmetry consideration, right? So I know the force that apply on this particle, the electric forces. There is no flow for the moment around the particle. And there is a motility matrix which relates, because everything is considered completely overdamped, of course, in this physics, there is no inertia, which relate velocity and rotations to the force and the torque. And this is a purely geometrical object. So we have something that tells you that one over A times the velocity and omega are related through a matrix to the force and the torque. And M, if you are away from any walls, for the moment I'm away from any wall, M will be diagonal. It will just be the, mo the mobility in translation times the identity matrix, zero, zero, and then uh, the, mobi the rotational mobility times the identity matrix. Because this is a six dimension vector, right? So these are three by three dimension. Yes. Yes. Let's do that. my mouse okay fine okay good okay um, okay so now we have the equations of motion for the object uh, and well of course this mu t you know it uh, it's 1 over 6 pi eta uh, a, uh, and this one a, a cube or something like this these are really the stokes this is really we are applying what uh, Michael Shelley has told us Four spheres, four spheres. So each of them here is diagonal and there is no coupling between the translation and the rotation. Okay, so now once you have this, you can couple the equations, do the linear stability analysis around the solution where the polarity is downwards and omega equals zero. You do the linear stability analysis, okay, it's a bit boring, but you do it and you find that it's unstable when, so there is one solution, one trivial solution to this problem is P equal minus P zero Z, where Z is uh, the unit vector pointing upward, and uh, uh, omega equals zero, that's one solution. And then it happens that this solution is linearly unstable when the field E is larger than the quink threshold, and the quink threshold can be computed, it's something pretty simple, it's the square root of a third, the viscosity of the fluid, the conductivity of the liquid, and uh, the permittivity of the liquid and the permittivity of the particle, which in my case were equal. Okay, so it's a linear stability. Okay, so that's the physics of the fact that this particle rotates. Is that clear? Okay? 
I skipped some things, but I mean, it's linear stability analysis of a dynamical system, so no, no worry. Yes, yes, exactly, it's in the bulk. And then you find omega, in this solution, you find omega is 1 over tau square root of eq divided by, no, e0, of course, divided by eq square minus 1. Okay, so it's a square root, as usual, but not really a square root of the direct control parameter, of the amplitude square, which is interesting because it tells you that it doesn't matter what is the direction of the field. It must be a function of the amplitude square. The sign of the field does not matter. Okay, so this was known and well known. Um, now, you have to now you have an object that is rotating, you put it on a plate, it's rolling. The true calculation of this is a real nightmare for many reasons. First, you approach a charge system to a plate. Very bad, mirror charges at the bottom. It's a dipole, so mirror dipoles, even worse. The field that was homogeneous, because you're approaching a plate, is not homogeneous anymore. So you have to make a perturbation around the homogeneous calculation that I've done here. Okay? And the main thing that it will do is that this matrix will not be diagonal anymore. The fact that the field is not homogeneous makes the, the expressions a bit boring, but it's actually small effects. The main thing is that because you are close to a wall, this mobility matrix, and these things, I, we didn't compute them, they are in hydrodynamics books or in the good GFM papers. The thing is to know which one and what page. They used to be long. Uh, so, um, and this is coupling rotation with translation. So this is really because this matrix becomes non-diagonal when you are close to a wall that the rolling motion induces translation. Okay. Note also that now that in this solution that I've described, I gave you omega, I didn't give you P, will not give you P in detail, but P has now a component that is parallel to a wall, to the wall, P parallel, and a component, which is negative, that is Pz. This will be useful for the following. Because it means that even in the 2D problem, we have dipoles that will interact. And this is nice, because dipoles like to align, etc. So that's, that's good. Okay. So, so I will not, of course, d compute everything. Uh, this is really too long, but you understand exactly the spirit of the physics. You have to solve the electrostatic problem in the presence of the wall, which is a zero, I mean, an equipotential of the problem. Uh, you do this, you have to write down the true motility matrix, you resolve the problem, you redo the linear stability analysis, and this time, not only you find an omega, but you also find a V, a velocity. Let's write it. Do you see all if I write here? Yes. The V which is minus epsilon of the liquid divided by epsilon zero, A, the size of the particle, a motility coefficient which is not the same as the one that you had there because of the wall, let's call it mu wall, uh, the amplitude of the field, and P parallel. So the velocity will be, and this we understand, because if you are rotating like this, P is like this, P parallel is like this, but obviously if there is a wall, you will go like this. So V is opposing P parallel. Okay, and this is the minus sign that I have somewhere here. Okay. Good, so the first thing is that this experimentally you can check. So experimentally in the dilute phase, you can measure the field at which you start seeing rolling motion and translation. You can measure the velocity. You know the field amplitude, and you know everything here. This only depends on the viscosity of the liquid and the geometry. So you know everything here. 
and you find a perfect agreement. I mean, it's normal, it's classical physics. But it's already nice, because usually when you have charges in a liquid, it can be a nightmare. Here it happens that because essentially the Debye layers, etc., are very small, uh, the things goes well. Okay, so this was checked and it works very well. Good. P parallel, so you see, so in the solution that is bifurcated from the trivial solution where the P is like this, now if I rotate, the charge are permanently slightly advected here. At the same time, they want to come back. The time scale that is balancing this is this tau. So they are here in the steady state solution. And now P is like this. Omega is like this. The velocity is like this. And uh, because P is like this, you have a P parallel component and a P perpendicular component. Okay? With respect to the wall. Of course, P parallel and P perpendicular ha are have a meaning as if you have a wall. There was another question, two other questions. Because these ones, you find them on a shell. Other question? No, that's right. Because the field is uniform. Other question? No. Okay, good. So, they rotate in the bulk they move on the wall. What is not completely trivial is that the fact that you have the image charge, etc., do not cancel the effect. Do you could have imagined signs killing everything? So no. Okay. Now, um, now we have our little individual rollers, and now we want to know how they interact. When you look at the movies, uh, no, no, we'll see them later if we have time. When we look at the movies, we see that the rollers are never touching. They are never even close to each other, at least one or a few diameters, even in the dense phases. So there is some kind of repulsive interaction. <laughs> we will find it. But what is very good is that because of this lubrification theory, etc., we can forget. This system is really a little bit piece of magic. Huh? Everything goes well. I mean, it was discovered in 2013, which is uh, 18 years after the Vichek proposal. So things that many people have tried many, many systems, so it's some kind of a natural selection process, right? Nothing to do with being specifically clever. Uh, okay. Um, it was well found. Uh, okay, so, um, so now we have to describe interactions. Uh, as, as, as I say, we don't need to describe n neither collision nor short distance, very short distance lubrification interaction. So it means we can describe the flow fields induced by these particles with Stokes let's light uh, physics. This is all what you learned this week and the end of past week uh, from Michael. So now you know all this by heart, right? And on top of this, you have to consider electrostatic dipoles. But this you have learned a long time ago how dipoles radiates and how they interact. So that's the story, essentially. No, the dipole, dipole. Yes, it's true, but this is not the one that acts here. But indeed, we don't know. So now we will assume that they don't come too close because of experimental observation do the calculations, and we find the terms that are responsible for the fact that they don't come too close. Okay? So to do this, what you usually do, you say, okay, let's first uh, say what are the particles doing in response to an external field, either electrostatic or hydrodynamics, that would be produced by other guys. That's the first step. Then you would compute what are the fields produced by the other guys, because everything is linear. Both Maxwell and Stokes equations are linear. You can add up. That's exactly the spirit of what was done this morning. And you find the interactions. So I will draw you the things, because now computing all this is no way in the time we have. And I al also, I think you had enough with my uh, lectures about this. Uh. But it's good that you, s you see where it comes from. I mean, it's really there. You, you can redo it. And it's pretty done in detail in the notes. I mean, not all the details, of course. but. So let's start with the electrostatic field. 
No, first let um, the result, the first thing is so you say, okay, I have an external field and then, okay, the result is pretty simple to derive, but let me just give you the, the, the result is that if you have an electrostatic field, uh, E, so a component of the field induced by the other dipoles, etc., parallel to the walls, I'm interested in the interaction in the, in the, in the plane, of course, then the velocity will align the velocity of another object will align anti-parallel with this field. Okay, that's... Um, the second thing is that, of course, the velocity will be advected by any flow, u parallel, and uh, the direction of motion will rotate because of the uh, strain rate. That's what we saw also with Michael. So there will also be a rotation of V, I don't know how to, okay, let's call it small omega, which will be parallel to, well, which will be induced to by the, the strain, uh, okay, the gradients of U parallel, the gradient parallel of U parallel, okay? That's what a particle feels when it is in an electrostatic and in an hydrodynamic field. These two parts, you learned it this week. And this one, I ask you to trust me. Okay. Okay, so we know this. And now we, know we need to know what are the fields produced by the particles. That's not too complicated. Um, we have... So what are the particles? The particle is essentially from the electrostatic, so okay, we have, okay. What are the fields produced by a particle? Field produced by a particles. We have the electrostatic field. And we have the hydrodynamic field. Okay. About the electrostatic field. The particle from the electrostatic point of view is a dipole. The dipole has a vertical component and a parallel component. The vertical component, they are all like this. What do dipoles like this do? They repel. They produce a field that is, ex that is radiating externally. So PZ will produce something. So if PZ is here, it will produce then depends on the convention, uh, it will produce a, del a, par a delta a parallel, which will be like this. A central E parallel. Now P parallel, and now it's more complicated because now P parallel, you have a dipole like this. This will create a dipolar field. I mean, it's a dipole, uh, so a dipolar field. This we know what it looks like. It will create a field. Uh, why are all my signs? Ah, there might be a problem with signs here. No. Okay. Something like this. Okay. Now, the dependence in R, the dependence in the distance are not the same for this one and this one. And furthermore, I have not told you yet that there is also a wall somewhere on the top. Far, but not that far. F few particles diameter. So because of this, there will be screening of the interactions. So these interactions induced by this, mediated by this. So you have the, these are the fields. Okay, so these are the fields created by any particles, and then we know that the particles respond like this to the field. So here we see, I should have said that, this one will be responsible for, so this is V parallel, responsible for the repulsion that we were discussing. So the repulsion is essentially mediated by the PZ, PZ repulsion coming. Here, okay, it's, it flows in the dipole shape. And both are screened. This means that both these things will be present as long as R is smaller than the thickness of the cell. And then they decrease exponentially. Okay? Question? Yeah. 
So hydrodynamics, no slip, and electric uh, isopotentials. Isopotentials. V equals zero, V equals plus V. Okay, so that's the, di the parallel dipole. This is the perpendicular dipole. They produce repulsion, it produces a dipolar flow. Now, the hydrodynamic field, this is the kind of things that was described by Michael, except that we are not dealing with a translating particle, but a rotating particle plus a translating thing. And there is a wall. But there is Mr. Blake, who is a champion in this, who masterizes images. So if you, ta if, you look, if you Google Blake GFM, you will have all, well, not all, but many cases where you have the singularities that describe this kind of objects. So the rotlet on top of a wall was described by Mr. Blake somewhere. It's, it's not nice because you don't just create a rotlet. You create rotlets and other things below. Uh, okay, but you can do it. And you will find an hydrodynamic field. This hydrodynamic field has several terms because of these images. It has several terms in terms of the radial dependence. And there, are, there is a first term at short distance. So a first term that is screen. This one makes a drawing like this. It's a very important one. It makes a drawing like this. This is the rotlets, essentially. So these are, this is the hydrodynamic field produced by these mo moving, rotting particles. And you see now that because another particle would be simply advected by this, the dominant order will be that the particle will do something like this or something like this. So this is a lining. This is repulsive. So at short distance, we have something pretty simple to understand. Repulsive and aligning. That's nice. Then at long distance, again, we have a dipole. I mean, at long distance, everything looks like a dipole if you have dipoles in the problem, right? Uh, at first order, at the dominant order. So again, for R, much larger than H. Ah, yes, I should say, why is there a long distance for the hydrodynamics? while you don't have it from the electrostatics, that's because mass is conserved. Okay. <sighs> okay, so, at the end of the day, uh, we have the interactions between the particles, we have their motion, depending on all the physical parameter of the problem. So, we can decently, I know we need one little piece of information. You can find it in the calculation, but since the experiment tells it to you very, very clearly, is that when you look at all the movies for a given external field, the particles always have a nominal velocity V0, speed, a nominal speed V0, which is extremely fixed. It does not fluctuate much. When they rotate, this can be computed. When they rotate, they don't change speed. This is quite remarkable. Um, this is related to, to this, actually. Um, so that we can really consider that all particles have a velocity v, which has a modulus that is fixed, and then an orientation n with an angle theta. You can both justify it by the calculation, and you observe it really very, very clearly. Then, the dynamics only consist in writing down an equation for all the theta and you have all the interactions. So, this will be something like okay, there will be a time scale here d over d theta i and then a sum over all the particle different from i here there is a linear hypo uh, hypothesis, but this linear hypothesis is uh, enforced by the linearity of the Maxwell equation and the Stokes equations. Of something, uh, okay, uh, functional, uh, we called it effective Hamiltonian, but uh, okay, that's a bad name actually. Okay. Uh, depending on the distance between the particles and depending on their little dipole. Okay?
this is a purely deterministic equation. When you look at the particles in the movies, you see that, okay, they have really straight lines trajectories, but there is a little bit of something. The persistence length is huge, like millimeters for micron particles, or huge. But there is really a little bit of something. It cannot really be thermal noise. The thermal noise is not strong enough for particles of five microns. So we, we have different uh, some, I mean, different explanation for this can be the irregularity of the surface, can be uh, the fact that there is still uh, a thin layer where what we have described is not correct, and there they could be, because, I mean, the orientation of the particle is not fixed by the theory here. They go in any direction, so it's a neutral mode, so any things will slightly alter this. And so, okay, we decide to add a noise here uh, with some amplitude, and some white, white noise. Of course, it doesn't have to be now right. We don't know this, but that's the minimal description. Question. There was a question somewhere. Yes. Yes. If you increase the field too much, they climb on each other, they link the two electrodes, and it bombs. <laughs> um, Okay, so now we have these equations of motions, which are Langevin equations. I have only five minutes. But so, I mean, this is the easy part for you, because you are a statistical physicist. You write down the Fokker-Planck equation for the n-body problem. That's straightforward. You have n Langevin equations. You write down the Fokker-Planck equations. It's additive noise. There is no trick. It's a potential uh, for, so you have a, the, the, the Fokker-Planck equations for the n-body distribution of the positions and the orientations of the particles. And the speed, we don't care. That makes life much easier. Then you integrate out n minus 1 of the particles, and you find an equation for the one-body distribution. This is really in all your textbooks. You know it by heart. When you do this, you have a problem. This one-body equation depends on the two-body distribution. And you have to make some assumption. We made an assumption, which, uh, which I mean, is the one that uh, Boltzmann would do or Enskog would do. Here we did something which is more like Enskog, actually. Uh, not really, because we don't care really about momentum transfer, but we did something saying that the distribution for the two particles at R1 theta 1, R2 theta 2, would indeed be the product of the two one body distribution, but we take care of the fact that if R1 minus R2 is smaller than a diameter, so if this is if R1 minus R2 is smaller, is larger than 2A, and the probability is strictly zero if R1 minus R2 is smaller than 2A, and this actually saves your life because you get rid of all the singularities that are present in this potential because of the 1 over R stuff. So you never go to R equals 0. These are not point particles. Okay, you can do that. Then you have an equation for this one body particle. You define your uh, hydrodynamic fields as you would always do. So how would you do that? You would say the density, the packing fraction, uh, that becomes a clumsy, very clumsy uh, blackboard, as always when I get in a hurry. And essentially the time is over, right? No, I still have three minutes. So, okay, you define your hydrodynamic fields. The packing fraction which will be 1 over pi a square, the integral over the angles of psi 1 of r theta, t. Similarly, the polarity pi, which will be, okay, pi a square divided by phi, integral over d theta, the little dipole describing the particles, uh, psi r theta t, d theta, okay, and you also need th another one, which is the nematic one, okay, I don't write it. You do this, 
And you're almost done because you find immediately by integrating your one body integration, uh, your one body distribution equation, you integrate it, you immediately find the conservation of mass. That's super classical, and this is the one everybody always gives an example because it's super easy. Then you have to write it down from this one, and you find that it depends on the one from this one. And then you have to write it down from this one, and this one a priori depends on higher order moments of these distributions. And again, you have a closure problem. So here I want to say something important. The closure depends on the kind of states that you want to describe. Uh, if you, well, if someone was able to propose a universal closure, that would be beautiful, but... So if you are in the isotropic state, of course, if you say that psi is strictly isotropic, well, that's stupid because then everything will be zero. I mean, you will never find any transition. If you say in your assumptions that the distribution of the angle in isotro is anisotropic, you will never find a state where it's not the case. So you have to say something a little bit more clever. Uh, and this is tricky. Close to the isotropic state, this is super tricky. Even for the Vicek model, there is a scaling argument due to Eric Bertin, Michel Droz, uh, uh, Guillaume Grégoire, I don't know who are the other authors. I don't know, I don't think Hugues was not yet in that one. And um, maybe Hugues will insist on this. It's a tricky argument, it's not easy, that convinced you that you can eliminate the equation on, on this one. That you find a relation between Q and pi, and then you inject it in the equation for pi, and you are done. You have a closed form. There's another argument, which is to say that these higher, mo these higher order equations will have, a s uh, will have a faster dynamics than the other. But I mean, this is wishful thinking. There is no really strong argument here. Um, but that would lead to the same closure, and that's very reassuring. OK, so you can do this, and you find your Navier-Stokes equation from this problem, close to the isotropic state. Now we know that the system exhibits a polar phase. In the polar phase, there is much chance that the approximation about this distribution, which is essentially what we do when we make this kind of closure, is not the same. Because here, the distribution is essentially pointing in one direction. So something that is close to isotropic will be wrong. So in the polar phase, a good approximation is to say, let's say that this is essentially a delta function pointing in the direction of the polar phase that I know, and I still want fluctuation, so I will put Gaussian-like fluctuation on uh, around my delta, except that it's on a periodic space, and this has a name. It's the uh, it's the damned von Mises distribution. Thank you. Okay. And so you do, this time you make really an assumption on the shape of the distribution. This also allows you to have a closure. And then uh, you have again another hydrodynamics equation for the polar phase. Okay? So now we are to the point where we have our hydrodynamics equations. Writing them would take something like half of the board. There are many terms. What is very nice is that all the coefficients of these equations, because we did all the hard job during one hour and a half, are related to the dielectric conductivity of the sphere, the conductivity of the liquid, uh, the viscosity of the liquid, the size of the particle, but we know really all these numbers. So there is no fitting parameter in this problem. These equations are the one they are. Okay? Okay. And so now you have hydrodynamics, so you, you do hydrodynamics, right? And this is what I will do at the beginning of the next lesson, is that we will consider this hydrodynamics flow, we will linearize around them, pre pre um, pre predict waves, compute the waves, the sound waves, and then what Denis Bartolo did in the past five years, he measured all that. And he could really check how far this hydrodynamics theory describes well this system. And we'll see that it works really amazingly well, so especially given that there are no fitting parameters. Okay, so I will do this uh, in the next uh, lesson. Thank you.